my hair? Okay, we you are look great. Yeah, let we, them in. Everyone look good. Hello. Oh, Q and A. I think we are live. Oh, here are the participants coming in. Sixteen. 17. Great. Hello, everybody. Invite copy, invite mic. Whoops. Sorry, I'm still working out the tech here. I think everybody is host and panelist. How do I see? Um, I can see the attendees. You can? Yep. Top right, click attendees instead of panelists. You can see. I say, hi, Sajad. Hi, Liz. Hi, Katie. Top hi, right. OK, I can't see them. Do you see it? I'll figure it out. Pop out. No, I don't see it. You said it's in the top right. Is that right? Mm -hmm. um, in the chat window. Yeah. So there's, you just have to toggle it. It's a terrible interface. You see panelists or attendees. Okay. Well, I don't see it, but I will figure it out after I jump off. Shall we get started? Okay, um, hello everybody. Um, welcome to um, Designing Your Research Agenda. This is our, I think it's our fourth one, but officially now that we've become a series, it's 3.1. Um, and I just like to introduce myself. I'm Dan Wong. I'm uh, one of the uh, co-founders and the chair of Design Incubation. Um, and I just have a few announcements. I wanted to make a few announcements before we got started. Um, so to begin with, uh, we have a number of activities going on at Design Incubation currently. The, uh, the most pressing one, I would say, because there's a deadline looming, is the we're having our annual awards uh, competition for design researchers. So please um, nominate your, your colleagues and your favorite design researchers. There are four categories. Um, there's scholarly publication, there's scholarly creative work, um, service, and teaching. And the deadline for submissions for that is December the 31st. Um, all of that is uh, currently announced on the Design Incubation website. Um, and then two other activities that are happening in the early spring. We are having a colloquium at the uh, College Art Association, CAA, um, which is uh, in Chicago this year. Our colloquium will be online, available online, although they've also given us a room at the conference. So if you're in the, if you're at the conference, please drop on by. Otherwise we will um, be sharing um, more information about that on the Design Incubation website. Uh, and then finally, we are having our affiliated society meeting at the College Art Association conference. This year, we are going to be doing a workshop uh, regarding developing abstracts, abstracts for conferences and other types of academic and scholarly presentations. Uh, we encourage you to come. It is free of charge. If you happen to have an abstract that you would like to be workshop, you can submit it anonymously or non-anonymously, non and we can deconstruct it and reconstruct it for you. So thank you all very much for joining us. And I will hand it over to um, my colleagues here at Design Incubation. Um, Jess and Heather, take it over. I'm going to add a couple other things just that I might have missed because it got loud in my house for a second. Did you mention the 10-year anniversary, Dan? Oh, no, I did not. Please. Yeah. OK. Now I'm going to leave that to you. Oh, OK. <laughs> Um, surprisingly, 2024 is our 10 year anniversary. Do not know how a decade has passed us by so quickly, but it's been an exciting 10 years. Um, and thank everybody for all of the, because this is a completely volunteer organization. So we are going to, 
um, do a little production and figure out what we want to do to celebrate um, that, but watch out for announcements in the coming months. Yep. And then just before I kick off this event, I wanted to add, um, do we want to talk about the trophy? Do you want me to announce that? Oh, yes, please do. Yeah. So as part of the Design Awards, Typhoon Lee of U Wisconsin-Madison has generously offered to conceptualize and design um, some kind of plaque trophy award this year. Um, so that's just sort of exciting, really generous offer to our community. And so this time people will have something tangible to take away as part of that. And the other thing, just in case, I just want to reiterate again, uh, because this is entirely volunteer and we're really trying to elevate the design community, we do have the call for colloquiums. Um, so if you are interested in hosting one at your institution, we're happy to support that. Um, I don't know if you already mentioned that, Dan, but I just wanted to say that again. And we are always looking for help. Um, okay, so now- I'm going to jump off here. I'll be in the background running the tech. See you all again at the end um, of the webinar. Sounds good. Um, so I am Heather Snyder Quinn. Um, Jess Barnes and I uh, began this event, I think, in 2020. Is that right? The first? Yeah, 2020. Um, so technically, this is really the fourth. Um, we, uh, everyone has had their own sort of path into higher ed, different tra trajectories. And so we were very interested in creating um, a welcoming, sort of humble, joyful space uh, for people to share their work, share their stories, uh, share their pros and cons, and, and very specifically to carving out a path of research and creative practice and understanding what that looks like across institutions, everything from community college uh, to our ones, public, and today for the first time international. So that's really exciting. Uh, looking at everything from MFA path to PhD path, all the different ways we can disseminate work and what that looks like, um, understanding what institutions expect and because we are all uh, creative practitioners, um, also really understanding how we can break the boundaries and the molds of expectations and, and even carve out new ways of sharing research. Um, so uh, today we are very lucky because we have a private institution, we have um, a smaller art school, and again, a uh, first time having an international school. So that's a little history behind the event. Uh, we do have all or most of these events recorded, and I know a lot of you have asked to see those. So we are working very diligently of trying to get those on the Design Incubation YouTube channel. Sorry, my dog is running around behind me. I know you can't see it, but it's super distracting. <laughs> She's very excited about the event. Um, and yeah, and today today's as well. So we are recording it. We'll be able to share that and reference it. Uh, of course, if you're interested in, in sharing your story too, please reach out to us and let us know. Uh, we're very keen on um, trying to introduce and bring to light folks who are often off the beaten path or maybe have quieter voices um, and, and just sharing the, the very enormous breadth of our field. Um, and though the lens is on communication design, we do look at design with a capital D. So if you're playing in industrial design or new media or other spaces, uh, we are also very open to that as well. So I'm going to turn it over to Jess. Thank you. Okay. Hi, everybody. Um, as Heather mentioned, I'm Jessica Barnes, and I'm also a co-chair of Design Incubation. And um, today we are so excited to have with us our three panelists. Uh, we have Johanna Meal, Nate Matisson, and Ayako Maruyama. And um, they're each going to have about 10 minutes uh, with a slide deck to talk through their research agendas um, and respond to some of the questions that we initially posed to them. And then after that, we're gonna be opening things up and you can come into this space for some Q&A. We'll also use the chat for some Q&A and um, we look forward to the discussions that are happening afterwards. So um, first up, uh, we have Nate, whenever you're ready. Howdy. Uh, sorry. All right. I assume everybody can see that. Uh, I didn't have a catchy title, um, but uh, I'm Nate Matisse. I teach at DePaul University School of Design, uh, which is in Chicago. Um, and uh, I'm going to talk about how I got to where I am. Uh, it was, uh, you know, I don't know. I don't know if it was unusual or not. Uh, I went to undergraduate school and graduate school for painting not design uh, a very dubious decision of mine that was way back in the 20th century uh quite some time ago and then i spent about 15 years of my life uh making a living <laughs> after having gone to uh, a studio art program um 
I did a bunch of stuff uh, and I taught pretty much throughout those 15 years part time and then started a tenure track. Um, it, it, this is interesting to me mostly because it happened 15 years after grad school uh, and I wouldn't recommend uh, that if you can <clears throat> avoid it. Uh, I showed up to my tenure track with a ton of baggage uh, because of those 15 years. Um, I was very lucky in some ways uh, because I showed up uh, to the party with some NSF money. For anybody who's not from the US, NSF is the National Science Foundation. Uh, I didn't really know all of this, but it's incredibly prestigious to have uh, public dollars from the NSF uh, in your CV. Um, but before my tenure track, I just made a lot of money working as a consultant doing <laughs> doing this work. So it was a big, uh, big shift. I also run an industrial design company. Uh, we make uh, guitars mostly. Uh, we, we used to make a lot of stuff, but now it's just guitars. Uh, I do a lot of work with a colleague who's also a professor uh, focused on a couple of dead Swedish architects from the 20th century. Um, uh, I used to do a lot of work in branding and lettering. Uh, and so that turned into a bunch of experimental typographic mayhem of various sorts. Uh, and my problem as an academic was I didn't want to give any of that up, you know, um, I wasn't really interested in having a nice tidy agenda. Um, and I made my life really difficult to myself. Uh, on top of that, 20 years after I'd gone to art school, I started a collaborative art practice with a friend in Los Angeles uh, who I had met uh, in undergrad school, who still uh, was a, a working artist, and uh, with my wife, who I met in grad school, <laughs> who's still a working artist. So I just, you know, I made uh, everything was really challenging um, to fit into a nice little uh, narrative. So I landed uh, at uh, institutional learning facility. Uh, if there's any suicidal tendency fans in the audience, you'll know what I'm quoting. Uh, DePaul is a it's a religious, private, nonprofit institution. Uh, luckily for me, because I'm a pretty pagan leaning person, it's not an evangelical sort of institution. Uh, the design program uh, is sort of unusually located in a college uh, dominated really by computing uh, and also now by cinema. Um, so we are, oh, my little scribble almost didn't show up. You know, we're a little bit angry uh, most of the time because we're overlooked and treated poorly and, you know, pissed upon. Um, in our university, our colleges make varying degrees of money. Uh, some of them lose money hand over fist. Some make a lot of money. Uh, our college makes lots of money um, by comparison. Uh, that's both good, you know, because it means there's resources that support our research. Um, it's also bad because a lot of our decision making winds up being about how do we make more money? Um, you know, so you know, there's pros and cons there. School of design didn't exist when I first joined the university. Um, you know, it started up like my second quarter in. So it's, you know, it, it was kind of exciting uh, to be there on the ground floor. Um, <clears throat> but there's, you know, a lot of problems with that as well. So uh, the perils that I faced on my path to tenure um, were to start out, we didn't have enough faculty to even make a personnel committee, you know, so we had to borrow faculty from other programs. And so, you know, we were having discussions about design practices, you know, with people from the cinema and not that they don't know anything, but, you know, we had these very uncomfortable conversations because, People really didn't understand, you know, what coming from the working world was like, things like that. Uh, we didn't have much mentorship uh, involved when I when I showed up. We have a little bit more now. Um, we had, and we still have, I think, terribly written policies uh, and standards in our local unit um, for, for tenure because we're so young, you know, and we just didn't have enough faculty to, to work on this stuff. Uh, we have insane, unsustainable service loads because we're such a small faculty, and yet we still need to do all the things that a, um, you know, that a program does. So uh, I didn't know any of this when I took the job. I, you know, I wasn't. I had taught part time for a long time, but I didn't come from a family uh, of you know college going adults. You know, and all these sort of in intricacies were uh, pretty new to me. It was hard to retain faculty. Uh, in such a small school, you know, we had a lot of turnover at first. And then, of course, the admins all was hounding you about growth because they want those fat stacks to get even fatter. 
And all of these things uh, have a tendency to steal time, you know, from, from your work. Um, Christ, I have a minute left. You can just cut me off, you know. Is there like a, a cane feature you can pull me off the screen? So uh, we're a liberal arts university that's focused on teaching um, primarily, but that university houses a college of computing that really wishes that we were at an R1. Um, and inside that is a, oh, where's my, come on. Well, there's a college of, or a school of design in there with something of an identity complex. Uh, the university also has a mission uh, if nobody's seen the movie, it's a little problematic, but it's so nice to see Robert De Niro, Jeremy Irons, Liam Neeson all together on the screen. It's great. So we're Catholic and we're also Vinci Vincentian. We're not uh, a Jesuit, so we're not there to convert people. Um, we're there to serve, um, which is good. Uh, you know, this is a quote right from our website. You know, we're... Um, we're tasked with reaching out to marginalized communities. Uh, we have a focus on trying to provide access to first-generation college students. Um, uh, we're concerned with sustainable futures. You know, there's a lot of really good things um, that give the university an identity. Um, it really is a constant fixture in your in your daily life there, I think, um, amongst most of the faculty uh, and the administrators. Um, I think it's a, it's a huge... Um, driver of faculty recruitment. You know, we recruit a lot of the faculty we recruit because of the mission um, and with students, it's the same thing. But it's not really a factor in your tenure. Um, you know, nobody's nobody's holding the mission up to your work and saying, you know, do these things really? However, oh man, there we go. Uh, there's a lot of internal support at our institution and a lot of that does, you know, align itself to mission-based um, projects and things like that. So uh, the institution has a particular view on research, scholarship, and creative practice. Uh, oh my God, I'm a minute over now. It's incredible. Um, so bad at this. You're uh, fine. We're good for time. No worries. Okay, cool. So, uh, and these are quotes from our faculty handbook. I don't know if I'm supposed to do that or not, but I don't really care. Um, so we have a, a clear definition of research, you know, it's generating new knowledge, you know, with standard methodologies from a pretty broad array of disciplines. And I suppose you could say designs in the humanities. So that's good. You know, there we are, we can do some design research. It also says scholarship is a bigger thing, you know, um, and it goes, I've, you know, goes to the standard taxonomy of scholarship, um, and, you know, describes these as the, the basic functions of a quality faculty member. But then problematically for me, it says creative activities refer to activities other than scholarship, which seems to be a very kind of old school formulation. Um, <clears throat> maybe now that I'm tenured, I'll, you know, try to rewrite the faculty handbook. So it looks for the visual learners in the room, it looks like this, you know, you've got scholarship and within that you've got these, oh, come on, why aren't you updating? You've got these four areas of uh, activity and then research. This is, you're killing me, Google Slides. Um, research is part of discovery, you know, the way it's defined. And then, I mean, you're absolutely killing me, Google. Uh, then creative activity is out here all by itself. So that's how I feel about that, because I feel like creative activity looks more like this, you know. And some of it, sure, doesn't have much to do with scholarship. But the great thing about DePaul, though, is that they don't really, that none of that really matters to you when you go up for tenure, uh, because the university is tasked with evaluating all, all of your output, you know, whether they think creative activity of scholarship or not, that still contributes, you know, to your, um, to your, to your tenure bid. So my disagreements are largely uh, semantic. Uh, lastly, you know, I was able to define a narrative loosely around my work um, uh, in that it's collaborative, uh, almost all of it. Uh, I feel like there's a big failure on my CV and that at least one line doesn't have a collaborator and I hate that. Um, it's, uh, I would call it anti-disciplinary because I, I hate disciplinary boundaries and I think they're kind of old artifacts uh, that we should destroy. Uh, it's decision oriented. I don't believe that design gives us solutions at all, but I am really interested in how we make decisions while we're working. And I don't know why a picture of kangaroos came up when I looked for images that had to do with decision making, but uh, it did. And most of my work's computational, whether it's um, designing a guitar or a book or a typeface, almost all of it uses computation, you know, in some form. Not all the computation is programming, but, you know, a lot of it is. Um, 
And I would say for any person going up now, four things to avoid in your work would be collaboration, um, because authoritarian bureaucracies like clear chains of authorship, and they don't like the confusion of the collaborative work. Uh, it's easier for them to haze individuals than it is groups because we can band together and fight back. Uh, so they don't like that. If you're trying to get consensus in your collaborations, everything works really slowly, but I like to work slowly, but you only have six years. So uh, I would avoid being anti-disciplinary if you at all could, because academia is fundamentally organized around disciplines. Um, that makes people comfortable. Uh, uh, there's rules to a discipline, right? There's boundaries. And so that makes evaluating your work really easy. Uh, and that has to be done. It's difficult to have fruitful conversations with disciplinary people, which is most of academia, um, because you're anti-disciplinary. <laughs> so um, that makes life hard. I would also avoid being anti-solution oriented um, because people like solutions. Uh, solutions are nice, aren't they? Um, they're transformed easily into conclusions and conclusions are easy to promote and market to the world, you know, to get eyes on your work. I would seriously avoid doing anything computational as a designer um, because, well, for one, see anti-disciplinarity. Um, it's also much like maths and nobody likes maths. Uh, it's hard to have good conversations with people that are into computation because they don't understand design and the corollaries. It's very difficult to have conversations about your work with designerly people because it's so fucking computational. So um, that's my path. Uh, I would say good luck to anybody on the road um, to tenure. Uh, I meant to get a link together. I've got my entire dossier online. If anybody wants to, I you know, it's hard to find them. It's hard to know what you're supposed to put together and what an external review looks like and things like that. So if I would say if anybody wants to look at one, I you know, mine's not great, but it worked. So uh, I'm happy to share uh, the material. Just I suppose email DI, you know, and one of them can get a hold of me or something. Anyway, uh, thanks. Sorry, I went five minutes, six minutes over. Good. Thank you, Nate. Thank you. That was great. <laughs> Everyone going to be asking for your dossier link now. I know. Okay. I was like, you can pop it at the chat. <laughs> kind of get a load ahead. All right. Uh, and next up, we have uh, Johanna. Whenever you're ready. Hi. Um, I'll just share, I think I'll share my entire screen. Let's just go. Um, you should see like a earth. Earthish. Yes, that's there. Um, yeah, uh, I, yeah. Hi, my name is Hannah. Nice uh, to uh, meet all of you and thank you for the invitation, uh, Heather and Jessica. Um, I am joining from Germany, as you can probably hear. <laughs> Um and it's uh it's Friday night and um yeah good to uh, be here. I'm a PhD student at the Technical University in Dresden and uh, my dissertation project is called "The World as a Design Problem." Uh, I'm not gonna explain it in its entirety because it's always like a you know a fearful thing that PhD students have to do. So I'll just kind of work around that a little bit. Uh, in terms of discipline. It is probably a design history, cultural studies work. Um, and I do want to talk a little bit about that because design history um, usually is kind of connected to something like this. Um, but I look at a history of design more as a, or design more as a history of ideas um, and not in terms of events and or iconic Western designs. Um, that are kind of um, uh, linear and it's very important what some man said in the 1920, but um, I see it more um, as a history of ways of looking at the world. And I think maybe just an easy way to get into it or explain it is uh, looking at a, at a kitchen. Um, this is the Frankfurt kitchen, I think it's from 1928. Um, and I mean, this is just now an example um, because we could, take this kitchen and um, put it in like a, in a specific modernist style or whatever. Um, but I think we, we can just shift our perspective if we just ask ourselves or imagine what if houses didn't have any kitchens? What, just like as an idea, 
um, the houses that we live in now. And um, I think this would prompt us to ask more questions. Like, what would that do to family structures? What would that do to um, how, like, um, structures or daily structures in the city? What would that do with um, the political economy or systems of labor or uh, gender politics, right? So, and I'm, I'm not saying that the kitchen is an invention of design, um, but certainly um, design um, has perpetuated um, the idea of the kitchen or has normalized it, the politics that are um, happening in them. So in many ways, I'm looking at how history is not so much in the history or in the past, but it is, um, it is in the in the present, and I guess this would be some, or this would be questions I I ask in my in my research. So if design is the lens through which we glimpse into possible futures, what are the futures we're capable of imagining? Um, and I'm kind of looking at uh, or specializing in the history um, of the problem or. I'm trying to uh, write um, a history of the idea of the problem in design and why design thinks it is able to offer um, solutions to um, problems such as the climate crisis. The climate crisis is kind of like my, my specialty. Um, so I'm looking at why or how design has um, contributed to us thinking that we can design our way out of a crisis and that we can fix it if we just find the right technology. Um, and again, this is not an idea of design, but design is part of um, shaping um, these uh, yeah, normative ideas that really shape our entire um, society as a whole. Um, so I am I'm interested in where do these ideas come from historically. So I'm tracking down history to better understand how specific biases or assumptions um, are deeply that are so deeply encoded into like our, our design methods, our design disciplines, whatever, how that came about. And to then maybe in the next step, think about how we might be able to design in a way that um, increases literacy of all of these kind of entanglements of design with um, um, with uh, politics or worldviews or um, that kind of stuff. So um, I my research is a more archival work at the moment. I'm focusing on a specific um, time and, and place. Like uh, my uh, focus is um, the 60s and 70s in the uh, US. So I'm, I'll be in the future, I'll be sitting in archives, looking at newspapers and looking at like old exhibition catalogs and doing all that kind of stuff. So I'm excited um, for that. And maybe I can talk a little bit about how it got to to that, to me being a historian, um, because I uh, that that oh, that's new. <laughs> um, uh, as I said, I'm at the um, chair for digital cultures. Oh no, I, I don't think I mentioned that before. But I'm at the chair for digital cultures at TU Dresden. It's a technical university. While well, we are uh, humanities people working there, that is also an interesting kind of. Um, kind of, how would you say that, relation, um, but the university is very interested in elevating humanities voices in the technical university. So we'll see how that plays out in the future. It's very, very exciting at the moment. Um, and yeah, I'm a PhD student uh, in the German system, of course. So I thought I'd just briefly kind of tell you what that looks like here in Germany, because we don't really have graduate schools or they're very, very rare. Um, either you get uh, money because you have a position that is kind of like a job, like a research associate or something like this, and you write your thesis in your free time, or you have a scholarship. Um, but the way that works is when you're when you're not in a in a graduate program, which again doesn't really exist. You're just basically on your own, uh, and what you do is uh, you just like write a proposal and send it to a random person that you think is awesome and then uh, ask if they would supervise you and they say yes or no that's kind of how that works and so I think this would be like my first like big okay and this is the struggle kind of story uh, because design is a difficult um discipline to start from going into 
an academic uh, career, or at least it was in the time I was trying to do that in Germany because there was really no infrastructure because like the design typically is not a field. They're like, okay, designer, next step, PhD. Uh, of course not, right? So um, uh, there was really no, not really an infrastructure or uh, not re something that would help you, you know, generate your topic, right? A proposal. Um, and you need so much of this tacit knowledge that you really don't know that you need to know um, because you've never heard about that, right? That's not kind of what your studies were all about. Um, so it's a lot about, yeah, finding out things that you don't know you, you you need to know and also trying to find your place not being readable as a scholar in academia because you're a designer but not really read readable by designers because you don't really design so um and yeah and then of course there's lack of the academic training so i guess it's it took me years totally years to uh kind of just uh try uh, understand what uh, what an academic career um, even is um i'm my degree my bachelor degree is in graphic design i'm originally a graphic designer i guess you can kind of yeah i'll show my insta maybe that's not good practice but like i used to work as an illustrator and an ar artist i was like a mural painter for a while and then you can so at some point see where it stops being like nice visuals and it just starts being like university events. <laughs> uh, that's kind of how it's there. Oh yeah, there's me giving like some talk. I think about here, <laughs> there's like a there's like a, a break in the in the practice. Uh, so yeah, I worked as a designer, illustrator, mural artist, curator, activist, and then also always had like positions or like research associate, research assistant. But as you can see, none of that is. Uh, history is like being a historian. Um, so I was a lot of things, but not a historian. Um, and I got into thinking about design in this kind of different way, way after my master's. Um, I was working in design education. Um, I was working as like a developer of a master's study course and began to question how we teach and learn about design. Um, so then I just kind of somehow started writing proposals <laughs> and writing emails to people um, and got accepted by a professor in art theory. And then a pandemic hit um, and I was alone uh, again because my supervisor had like long COVID, didn't see her for a year. And then I just kind of can show you this video of me trying to read theory at home, but don't really know how to do it. So I made, I made like stop motion series uh about like that was like my pandemic practice to make like a little a stupid movie a day um so yeah but the pandemic also had very good sides because i learned that you can just write emails to people and they're probably happy to hear from you or they are not like who who are you even <laughs> that's not that's not what happened um so I don't know, I began to kind of just reach out a lot and try to find other people who are doing design uh, scholarly or whatever. Um, so this is like uh, 2020, a video where I just made like, I was like, you know what, people just do like online workshops. So maybe I just do an online workshop. Uh, and I just tried to find other people that are doing thought when I thought there must be out there right uh, people doing this kind of stuff so I just randomly started online workshop because it was uh practice in like pandemic times right um and um yeah maybe the the next the last point I can probably mention is like this transition okay from like practice to or from like design practitioner more to like design researcher or historian what made that happen um and I have to say that teaching really really helped me uh I got a one teaching position in 2020 where I was allowed to do whatever <laughs> it was in like media theory uh so that really I taught so many things I really was no expert in whatsoever um and that helped me um or it helps me understand these things like uh, um, so much better or I, I kind of had 
experimental courses where we find out together, me and the students, right? Or um, I would um, I would always suggest that as like just like taking a leap and doing something, doing a course on something that you because you're always more of an expert than you think you are, um, for sure. And um, yeah, I also did a lot of things because I had no idea what academic practice is and I did them very naively. That is also very good, <laughs> I think. Uh, I made a design conference. This is actually where I met um, Heather because I was like, okay, so academics do conferences. Okay, how hard can it be? Let's just like make one. And then it's like, oh, they publish books. Okay, how hard can it be? Let's just do that. Um, so this is kind of... Um, yeah, naivete maybe is a good. It's also a good uh, thing to have, to to have, not knowing what uh, uh, what's the kind of work that entails uh, until it's too late and you and you you have to do it. Um, so yeah, and uh, and I guess I. After this, uh, I, this conference, this was actually a conference. I was like, okay, I'm making a conference that I would kind of like to see happen. Um, and after that, I um, quit all my jobs, moved, and then I started the uh, the PhD. And I guess um, the biggest learning from this kind of convoluted path um, that feels like I'm a little bit also that I'm always too late. Um, is that you can just write to people and probably they want to they're they're friendly and probably they want to do things and probably it's not um, it's totally okay to ask um, also to elevate each other and celebrate each other's work um, uh, because not to like pass on this these barriers right just because things were hard for you to find out and make sure that the next generation that it's easy for them to find out about this kind of stuff um so yeah spill infos um and then also yeah finding strength in the fact that we as like design people were not like born and bred academics maybe this is really or picking up on, on what we uh, just heard from Nate like disciplinary disobedience is is a good thing um and yeah to find strength and having different approaches and not being like so so disciplinary um, and then um, th that it's good also to look elsewhere because there's so much research about design from other fields that I had no idea existed. And um, that that is, um, yeah, uh, important, important to uh, have like, just your feelers out. Feelers out. Um, yeah, I hope. I, I have no, I didn't, I have no idea what time it is, uh, but it's, that will be for myself in the morning. Thank you so much. You're right on. <laughs> All right, uh, Ayako, you're ready whenever you're ready. Thank you. I am going to share my screen. Can you see this as a full screen? Ugh. Hang on. One moment. I'm ready. Is that a full screen? Great. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for having me. My name is Ayako Maruyama. Um, I have a... Uh, I'm, I'm in Providence, Rhode Island. Um, I'm Filipino Japanese living here in the United States, and I'm excited to share a very disparate presentation on thoughts on research and some of the work that I've done, some of the work that I'm doing, but I'm really, really grateful to be in the company of um, all of you in design incubation, learning a lot about how important a space like this is for people like us who are trying to <laughs> figure it out. Um, so. I will share my obsession with electric fans later, um, but this is some of the newer work that I'm interested in. Um, I also, so I work with the Design Studio for Social Intervention, which is based in Dorchester in the Boston area. Um, 
and the uh, University of Orange, which is a free people's urbanism school in Orange, New Jersey. Um, and I also am an assistant professor here at the Rhode Island School of Design. Um, very recently uh, on the critical review track, which is our um, equivalent of tenure and um, have been teaching part-time since 2014 at the Boston University graduate program for city planning and urban affairs. And then since 2017 here as an adjunct faculty um, at the industrial design department. So I'm just gonna click through. Um, I wanted to start with this image. You know, when I think of research, I think about what are we searching for? Um, this is an image in Western Hokkaido. Actually, if you can see my mouse, I, I think we were here. We just like went Bleep, and then most of our tour was like west, uh, east. Nope, that's the west. Yep, <laughs> so we were already here by then. So I, I'm sharing this a little bit um, just to get myself out of the box. This was such an in, uh, exciting invitation to um, think about research with in a very different way. Um, but I've shared this this talk before through the lens of really like understanding what research is in a you know from a personal and the struggles that we go through in academia to sort of like post rationalize and sort of like you know, squeeze reasons and causality together. But I'm just going to start with this. Um, you know, we, my husband and I had the privilege of, uh, in, a, in a, you know, we're in a very new point in our lives where we had the space to do such a bike tour um, over the course of a few months. And you can see the little map below that sort of shared our route. Um, my my labels are here on the screen, right? Like I think we come with a lot of like Nate's baggage. I really love that image. These are this is like if this could be suitcases, here they are, right? Like we have, I mean, they're they're both labels, baggage, and I think power and privilege, right? Like we get to show these things and drop these words and enter new spaces or be invited, right, to talk about them. And so I'm also thinking a lot about how we employ or deploy various terms in order to sort of be in these conversations to begin with, and then um, transforming them. So um, I found this really cool globe <laughs> in one of the inns that we were staying in. Um, actually, the inn was right here. And I never grew up in Japan. I never grew up living there, but grew up going there a lot. And so going to do this bike ride meant so much to us in terms of how we got to move through space and understand and create co-create uh, memories and relationships to Japan. So I think it's important to say that research the pro, you know, the process happens in the mind, in the body, right? Like we are people, we have bodies. It happens individually and in community, in English and not in English. Um, and I think it's also has so much to do with time travel, right? Like it can happen in the past. We draw so much from that. Um, it can happen in dreams. It can, it's from our ancestors. It's in the present. It's in the future. And so, you know, where, when, what else? Um, but all this is to say, like, you know, what moves us to know or search for more? I think it's really important when I share this with my thesis students or even my undergrads, like identifying our position, um, whether we're in an institution and housed with many of those like little bubbles and labels that enable us to move through spaces and communities with privilege. Um, but also discerning what it is that compels us, right? Like understanding some of these currents or patterns that have inspired us to move, even moving through knowledge. Um, just another slide of like what I think about with, as I'm starting new research, you know, what does that set in motion for me or for others? Who will it help and who might it harm? I think we're all very <laughs> attuned to this um, yeah, attuned to this dynamic. Uh, just a quick slide again, like I, I mentioned to you before, like this was such a, uh, a privilege to be able to move through a place, um, you know, post-rationalizing. Sure, it could have been research, but we were just like having a good time. People were like, did you train for this tour? I'm like, nope, 
you train on tour, never done anything like this. Maybe you did like a weekend thing to Horse Neck Beach in Massachusetts. Um, carried more for a weekend than I did for this two months, you know, so learning a lot as we, as we go. I'm pulling a lot of metaphors from that trip. One of the things that I've, um, on my Filipino side, you know, thinking of this term, maki agitabi, which in my mother's, uh, in my mother's dialect, Bicol, we say when we're asking for permission, going through sacred places. So I also want to just speak to research is an act of revealing the hidden, right? And research, when we think about who gets to then see that is a point of you know, political conflict sometimes for many of us. Like, are we, re you know, research for liberation and healing? Does it mean we have to, you know, validate something or create an argument in order to affect some sort of change? There are so many things about research that have enabled the destruction or transformation of a particular place and community. This is also in Hokkaido. So, one of the things that happened was also just like thinking about research through the body, right? Seeing representations of place. I think when we try to locate ourselves in the larger landscape of <laughs> um, where our research lies, what contributions to the field are we making, where things have been and where things are going, where can I affect change? Um, it's always, yeah, I always have this it's been really interesting to think about different vantage points. Um, at the University of Orange, again, which is a free people's urbanism school where we believe that the city of Orange is the textbook and you can learn about any American city by learning about the history of urbanism in, universe, uh, in Orange. Um, they are you know, such an inspiration for place-based organizing and also just that reminding us that everything happens in a place, right? Like this is, we cannot be sort of in a, um, yeah, can't be place agnostic. There are cultural, geographic, natural contexts in which we are all operating in. Um, this was just a cool slide. This was such a cool experience to be in a caldera city. And so just again, like the body and understanding with all our senses where we are, but feeling elevation, you know, like biking down, we were, I think we took this photo from over here. Um, and just like we spent the night here and just feeling that was really interesting. So again, like metaphors around topography and altitudes of what we're trying to do, right? Conceptual altitude, um, being on the ground, gazing from above. And I think research can hover and has a very particular gaze, right? Like understanding, constantly trying to toggle between, okay, where are we on the phone? And where is the sign? And where is that mountain? Just that vantage point switch, I think is just a really important reminder for me as somebody who has and uses my eyes um, in order to locate myself. Again, like constantly trying to navigate the politics of institutions or the relationships that are promising or the you know potential harm my research could do. There's so much toggling. So I just wanted to speak to that in this community with all of you now is just like trying to think about like where and when do you get to um, notice when you're toggling? Um, here are here we are. A lot of the tour we were looking like this, right? Like so the postures of trying to locate ourselves uh, is just, you know, it's it's a particular posture. Little reminder here of that toggling. I'm just trying to draw, bring the point home. But again, like I built new muscles and synapses for my own internal navigation system and sense of place. And I think that was a big principle for me that I still try to remind myself um, to use in, in these spaces. There was a point too, our goal was to go from this northern um, most point soya or Soya Misaki or Cape Soya in Hokkaido to Sata Misaki in Kagoshima. And at one point, we just, our, our dot just started, you know, had nowhere to go. Like we really just like ran out of, you know, the, 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 the blue dot that located where we are just sort of had to end. 
So that was a very visceral feeling, a graphic design moment and a philosophical moment and a, a, a really sad and exciting time. Um, so I think in thinking about, you know, research and activism and identity, I, I opened with a story, you know, this story about our bike ride, but I wanted to also think about how we are employed to contribute to the field of generalized knowledge, right? Or we are mm, asked to contribute to the field. And in that, you know, what is legitimate research? And is that even the question? So I've been working on that a lot in the various spaces I inhabit. Um, I think Johanna, you mentioned a pandemic <laughs> moment and this was mine. <laughs> I have enjoyed zines and making little booklets out of paper for a long time, but it really was inspired by an artist named Malaka Garib, who's a Filipina Egyptian American comic book artist who ran this workshop. I was very excited about her work before she wrote this um, graphic memoir called I Was There, American Dream. Um, and she ran a workshop which then led to me running workshops and then just making many, many zines with many, many people. Um, it was one of those things that, you know, it enabled me to be in community through a screen in a room. Um, it then led to a series of work called autobiographies. I also go by Aya. Um, but, you know, thinking about how we play with this idea of an autobiography, the, the quick pace of a zine, um, has you know so much legacy in um, queer and black uh, communities who you know subvert these notions of publishing and the red tape that comes with it in order to sort of put your stories on paper in order for it to last. So this was a really exciting. This was one of um, one flyer I made uh, for an amazing uh, opportunity to work with arts and democracy based in Brooklyn, and they also uh, are part connected to the efforts around um, naturally occurring cultural districts. But the autobiography, you know, I was combining autobiography and zines, but really trying to experiment with a graphic memoir book that I'm trying to do, but have no time to do. And so like, what would it look like to do to write your autobiography with your family one zine at a time and also what would it feel like to write our own stories how do we control our narrative and what stories will they read about us in the future so i think it also questioned this notion of primary source um, what does it mean when we document our own stories reference and each other's lived truths produce work for future ancestors to cite and connect to and also steward a collective archive. So there's this sort of idea of like permanence and um, enshrining stories in the written word on paper through print. Um, I do, I do want to speak to where so much of my practice began with the design studio for social intervention. Um, I mentioned to you we are um, based in uh, the Boston area. The Design Studio for Social Intervention is an intersection of um, activists, artists, and academics, but it was co-founded by Lori Lobenstein and Kenny Bailey, who came from community organizing and really, through a residency in a design context, realized like there are design studios that exist to prototype things. Why don't we have that for the public sector or the social justice sector? So I really... Um, I'm not as uh, deeply embedded or deep, uh, I'm not there day to day. I used to be, uh, I used to work there for the past, uh, since 2012 um, to 2019 as a design principal and really creating um, immersive spaces, thinking a lot about how we engage people through um, material, linear, nonlinear processes and again, was really drawing from my industrial design toolkit for a long time. Another significant project that I'm excited to share with you um, that really has pushed these notions of um, uh, how and where we make space is the Social Emergency Response Center. They are pop-ups to say the least, but really a place for everyone to gather when there is a named social emergency. So this comes from 
um, a lineage of work that really, you know, enabled us to first like identify when there's a social emergency happening and be like creating procedures for them and then pulling from that metaphor like creating a center to respond so there have been dozens that have popped up um here's one the first one in boston we did one last week actually this is with a brazilian immigrant um community group called jigai and this one's at parts and crafts in somerville so we also created you know a manual and a kit that has also enabled it to continue to be in places. We found out about some after the fact, we've been involved in some of them. Um, and we even were, was, were able to host a month long circ in a regular way during the height of the lockdowns in a very creative Google slideshow immersive space. Um, I think time is, Ticking. So I'm going to breeze through this one. We have a book. It's a framework for how we do our work. Um, I'm excited to share it with you. And it's always free as a PDF. Um, but really, it's about uh, this idea that ideas are embedded within arrangements, which in turn produce effects, and that arrangements are a really rich terrain to think about social change. So some of the emerging research that I'll end with now is like my opening slide has electric fans. I'm obsessed and <laughs> thinking about indoor cooling and drying clothes. Um, and, you know, thinking too about like where and how do people get to be part of your obsession and how do you package that passion in ways that are gonna be consumed? And um, how do you also create the projects and get the funding and, you know, create the validity for your work um, while you're genuinely thinking about these overlaps constantly. I think we're 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 looking for a lot of um, new ways of thinking as we're trying to cool and be comfortable, but also be reasonable. So this work has connected a lot with disassembly and dismantlement, repair and recovery and maintenance. And I'm excited to be developing a studio for this as well as different outlets for this work to be shareable with all of you. Um, I wanted to speak, uh, and almost I'm done here, I wanted to just speak to the research statement. <laughs> so this was the research statement that I used and was I as I was in the academic job market and um, really thinking about how we, um, yeah, how, how we're entering, uh, we're, incre we're working with students who are really interested, I mean, our peers alike, in interdisciplinary spaces that demand collaboration. So I'm already, I'm I'm in my demise according to Nate's list. Um, <laughs> and really, so research is investigating, theme of my research is really investigating that collaboration and repair are at the fulcrum of effective design. Um, I wanna speak to working with graduate research assistants and colleagues and friends and critics alike. I think it's important to actively create spaces for healthy collegiality and accountability, um, and also for critical discourse, vulnerable curiosity, and shameless discarding. Some things just are not worth the time and you gotta move on. So thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. That was great. I, I'm so inspired right now. <laughs> I just I love watching all of these uh, ideas and images. And um, yeah, thank you all so much for sharing your agendas. Do we want to let the folks in who want to come in? Dan? <laughs> Yes, I, I'm inviting um, questions um, in the chat. And if people would okay. like to be added to the um, panel discussion, uh, just raise your hand and I'll bring you into the visual yeah. area. We like seeing you in the room. Come visit us. Well, we have a question that popped up already in the chat. Um, I'm thinking this is a question for everyone, but um, how do you view the incorporation of a model where individual service part-time teachers part-time service providers and part-time researchers as a healthy practice 
for design researchers. Hi, Sajad. <laughs> Sajad teaches with us. So, um, and uh, maybe I could try to, to um, for, just speak from my experiences because I did uh, try to do all that at the same time, and um, it's um, it's really hard. I mean, I, yeah, I I had a, a job as like a, a study program coordinator. Uh, doing a conference, was teaching three courses at three different universities and tried to do my own research. And of course, that last thing I did not do at all. Um, it is super hard and the structures are not very um, set up to help you much in, in that regard. Um, so there is, uh, I, mean, I mean, you said the word healthy. So how could you do that healthily? I did did that very unhealthily um, and I'm now uh, in the very lucky position that I did get a, a scholarship so I do not have to work uh, at the moment and for doing a PhD that is really um, it is also it, it's, at some point it, it's it's you have to say no to stuff uh, and really uh, focus on your work um, and yeah to but I, at the same time you have to um, have a stable income so doing that healthily is very difficult and only possible if you have a good community um, I think and find a passage where you only have to do your your PhD if that's what you mean Another question came up in the chat. This one's from Dan. <laughs> uh, do you feel that your institutions influence your scholarly directions and research? Good question. Good question. I mean, for myself, I would say not really. I mean, you know, my my work, sadly, doesn't really intersect with my institution's mission very much. I mean, like, I love the fact that the institution has the mission that it has, you know, because I like being in the classroom. And I think, you know, getting a design education was, could be true, really transformative for people, you know, um, especially people that, you know, don't come from a whole lot, like some of our students. But, you know, my research really doesn't have much to do with, to do with it. <laughs> I mean, the work I do for, you know, the, with the University of Chicago, the NSF money, it's all about the climate and energy policy and things like that. But it's not activist work, you know. I mean, it's it's educational. It's research about, you know, it's the opposite, you know, if anything. I mean, really, it's making an argument that the only way to get to green energy is to go through coal, you know. And, you know, it's like really kind of bleak. So anyway, I'm going to shut up. I mean, we're, we're a teaching college, right? And not so much a research, uh, definitely not R1. Beginning, I think, over the past few years, really beginning to try to wear that research jacket <laughs> a little stronger. And, you know, a Office of Research has emerged, various ways in which we're being signaled to create new forms of making and knowing. Um, and so I think the, to your question, Dan, I, I think there, there's, there are prompts to really think about our work as research and then the discernment one has to go through to, to, to tease out, like, what is research? Where does that feed? What does that feed? And then where's my work and my practice? Um, but I think that, you know, the the department I'm in and thinking about industrial design, like the the questions the institution is um, thinking about around just transitions and sustainability, are de I, they do influence my work to some extent. Well, maybe you could go to the next, just the next question. Sure. It was like, do you, do you think there's a fine line between art and fine line between art and design, or is art embedded within design, um, where you can certainly become multidis 
interdisciplinary. Uh, the way I, as a historian, would answer this would was, would be not to answer this, but to uh, propose a different question instead, uh, because I think this is what I meant in the beginning. Um, the uh, or like a um, an analytical way on design is not so much asking, um, is this design yes or no? Is this art yes or no? That would be like this this like history timeline that I showed in the beginning, which is like that's the canon, that's not the canon, so that's not design. Um, but more uh, look into who mobilized specific ideas about what design is to what ends, or what are the um, other systems of ideas or cultural narratives that design is kind of Im embedded in. So this would be question I would ask um, uh, because when you oh yeah when you are like okay this is design this is not design this is also like connected to to already systems of um, of of power or of hegemony right um, and th these histories are certainly um, problematic. You want to move to the next question? Yeah. I'm going to go down. Oh, Liz DeLuna says, amazing presentations, everyone. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Hi, Liz. I agree. Yeah. Um, for each panelist, this is coming from uh, Nikita. What has been one of the most influential resources for understanding what a research agenda is and how to set a research agenda? I, I don't know that I've gotten one resource but i think i probably learned the most from my colleagues you know um not that they had answers but just talking through what you were doing you know over and over and over until it seemed like you might go mad you know um, <laughs> <laughs> was about the only way that that i could really do it because i think everybody's is a little different you know which is a non-answer you know um but it's you know it's the old adage it's it's a process not a product and you know you just kind of have to I think work your way through it but having finding you know trying to find yourself at an institution where you've got really good colleagues you know that's about the most important thing I think you could ever do you know is to surround yourself with people that are that are actually going to help you you know which is difficult <laughs> you know it's not it doesn't you know, academia can be like cutthroat and awful and everybody's, you know, fighting over nothing. And, you know, I mean, so I think that <clears throat> that's about the, the best resource you could have is try to find some really good colleagues. I agree. Yeah, and like, and also like the, uh, speaking to you now, there's a, like the proposal that I'm trying to work through now is like the 20th. It's, it changes, right? <laughs> you start out with one idea and then you find out about yeah. that and you're just doing that. So of course, it's not going to stay the same. So, yeah. I think, um, no, uh, it's fun to always like find an edge. You're like, wait a minute, there's a wall I'm up against. I don't believe in that. Or like, you're like, oh yeah, I, I, I like that. I'm going to walk through that door. Um, and that feels like a real, that, that's when it, things feel real to me, is when I can feel the edges. And I think um, one important resource for understanding what a research agenda is, has been research that I've seen agendas that are not what I want to do, or that I find are um, harmful, or, you know, in retrospect, not a success, or became a certain you know went in a certain way and I think that we have has so many things in history and like more you know contemporary examples of that or thinking of um yeah various agenda from different spaces that can tell us what isn't quite <laughs> the way we want to frame things or should be framing things thank you and another question, this is from Denise. 
Does any any of your universities have a policy that defines what design research is and is supported by your institutions? Uh, my institution does not. I mean, you know, it's a we have a very general understanding of you know what research is, and that's you know every unit has its own you know tenure and promotion policies, but they have to be commensurate with the faculty handbook. You know, so. Uh, even though my unit is the School of Design, uh, I mean, our policies are, I think, a shambles, really. <laughs> you know, they're not written very well. And, you know, we're constantly poking at them and, you know, whatever, but there's nothing particularly clear, which, you know, I mean, it's a problem, I guess, but it also frees you up to be able to do all kinds of stuff, you know like disassemble electric fans and you know i mean like you just get to explore all kinds of things because there's so few boundaries but but that can i think that can also be really hard for a lot of you know junior faculty who are just starting a tenure track to you know to not have any definition about this is what your work should look like you know that makes it really difficult and speaks to the next question too i think from lauren like you know like my agenda was entirely retro you know, perspective, trying to find some way to draw a meaningful thread between all these projects that intuitively I knew, you know, all made sense together because I did them, <laughs> you know, like they're all my work, so they must make sense. But, um, but finding that, you know, like I was allowed to do it because we had no definition of design research, you know, but it was really hard to go backwards and say, okay, I'm going to connect all this stuff. I was like, I'm always envious of, you know, younger faculty primarily because they're younger, but also because they're right out of grad school, you know, um, <laughs> uh, you know, and you've got like, you just did your thesis, you know, and so you can leverage that into this cohesive, understandable agenda. And I found in that uh, it took me eight years because I postponed my uh, tenure twice, um, because I was in a rush and I was trying to just make it the longest track in the history of American academia. Um, Mine will be just, longer. Yeah. <laughs> I discovered that all these things that I had done in grad school were still on my mind. You know, they were just harder to get to because I had 15 years of just trying to make a living, you know. So doing it retroactively, I think, was hard, but it also allowed me, you know, to do an enormous amount of weird stuff. I'm going to show up. Again. I think that's why it's so nice of you to share your dossier because I feel like I saw I saw you evolve through this real time, you know, and being in the meetings where people are like, how are you going to frame yourself, Nate? And now you see, now you see it, and it's so beautifully done, like co connecting all these disparate things, and it's so clear. So for anyone struggling with the same things, it's, it's really nice. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, I think that's super generous and really, really rad, <laughs> pretty radical, right? Like, I think that actively trying to create collegiality and community and like all those type of, yeah, just like something that felt intuitive in one space isn't necessarily so here. Um, and I think that, yeah, that super inspires me. I also wanted to speak to like, it does matter more than you think that you did all those things, right? And I think that's where we are pushing the like blurriness between like research and identity as well and like when and how to put one facet forth or try to combine them and so i like to think that the lack of um the lack of definition around research like many people have said in the chat are does mean that we can be defining that or pushing that um or helping students also like figure out what that means. Yeah, I think that kind of connects to the next question a little bit. And from, from the chat, um, Lauren says, can anyone speak to the extent to which your research agenda was crafted with foresight or how much of it emerged retrospectively connecting dots um, between disparate projects and queries you pursued over time? And that kind of, I think, um, uh, what uh, Ayaku said already kind of answers that because none, okay, for me it was like none of it was planned in foresight. Uh, actually, the project that is now like my main project was just a side note in the first draft of something else that I was like, 
I don't know. Um, so, uh, but retrospectively, I can really point to many, many different projects that didn't have anything to do with university or anything that was already like, ah, okay, I've always been interested in this. Or, um, and yeah, because you are you propose a project that you want to do and you want to pursue for, for a year. So it probably has something to do with you. And I also think it helps uh, because like in the beginning of an academic career, or, or at least uh, for me, I always like that. I always thought like, okay, so who, like who asked me to do this? What, what do I have? what do I have to say about this um and um looking at like uh, your unique kind of the dots you're mentioning in this um in this um in your in your comment like many people have said something about the topic before maybe but they don't have the dots or the coordinates that you have so they don't have the perspective that you have so you do bring something new to the table um from all the things you are uh, not just like designer, academia, or, or whatever. And we have a follow up question um, from Liz. How do you intertwine creative practice and professional work into your research agendas and tenure dossiers? I think this is following up with the comment I made about um, you know, some institutions will allow really only for creative practice professional client-based work and others will broadly include research. How do you bring those things together? I feel like my unit had a certain disdain for professional work, you know, for work that you'd been paid to do, which I found funny because I came into my tenure line with, uh, with public funds, with NSF money, um, you know, like six figures of money to be doing data visualization work. But before I was tenure line, I was paid to do it. Like, you know, I ran my office off that money, <laughs> you know, and the work hadn't changed, you know, it, just where the money came from and the amount of it. I made a lot less money, you know, from the NSF than I used to make on my own. So it's a weird, it, you know, it's a weird attitude. The industrial design work I do really isn't client driven, you know, and so I feel like that was was more accepted but in my cv i put a bunch of um crowdfunding i put kickstarters my company funded a lot of projects with kickstarters and so i knew that people didn't like that in my cv but i didn't care to me that's peer review like those other designers funding those projects are my peers you know um and so you know i i think it's confusing and it's hard to combine it all in an academic space but I think you just kind of have to go off reservation, you know, um, but that's dangerous, <laughs> you know, and so I wouldn't, you know, even though I feel like that's the only way to do it, I wouldn't advise anybody to do it, you know. Well, I think like the, like how to, how to do like creative work and academic work at the same time, or maybe not even yeah, parallel is a very, very good question. And something I definitely haven't figured out yet completely. I'm trying to find ways because I mean, as I said, like I'm now going in very theoretical, very text-based uh, work, and I love that. Uh, but uh, also, as that, uh, as I said, I'm I'm a graphic uh, designer. I'll probably never stop doing that on the side, or or let's say it, even though it, it not primarily is my output, it influences everything I do anyway, right? Because it's just that's just part of um uh you're, you're looking at, at things now i uh, i guess and um i'm definitely open to uh, or need to talk to more people to find ways of how to do that in the future i've been trying out things where I maybe apply to conferences and try not to do a talk uh try to uh, i don't know go into doing something that's more performative or last time i did like a i don't know was like a science fiction audio walk or something to to just kind of um, give yourself these new restrictions and like disrupt academia with non-academic stuff. Um, but yeah, I also am still looking on how to do that better. I mean, we we're we're here because of our 
practice. I think we're, we're obliged to maintain a, a professional practice and teach and do um, service through committee work, both in the department and school-wide and, um, and research. And so while all of those are part of what we're doing, the schedule doesn't quite reflect the same. <laughs> You know, like the, the 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 distribution of time and what are what where we are demanded doesn't reflect that all the time, and so it is. You know, it's all about like, yeah, scheduling is a radical act, <laughs> and how do you defend that personal practice day or that really like that time you have to be connected, make time to like show up to your colleagues' conferences or events or just like be in the community, right? Like um, be an advisor to a design challenge group here and, you know, Design by Rhode Island is another group that um, I work with. So yeah, I think it's just like a really, um, it's it's definitely intertwined and and at least from where I am, it's expected to, to do all those four things in not necessarily equal parts, but in some ratio and then be evaluated on that yearly. Another question for you too in the chat. <laughs> yeah, for um, Ayako, uh, could you talk more about what you meant by research not in English and how that comes up in your work? Oh yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm multilingual and I come from, like I mentioned, I'm Filipino Japanese and I think being here in the United States, we, I mean, English is so predominant, I can, in, in the work, but uh, I think that the archive also exists in English here, and so who will be remembered, and, and so I, I think about, like, even just the framing of things not in English <laughs> as a perspective, and working with a lot of international students, and then going to either Japan or the Philippines, and working and trying to sort of like do research and the act of translation is not nothing, right? Like it, it, it so much gets lost, um, so much power shifts too when you're trying to reframe something and translating doesn't just mean changing the language, but it also means that you're foregrounding some context or you have to re revisit some givens that would happen in a particular culture and so I like to say non-English work rather than the actual language because I want to situate the power that English has in so much of the work that drives so much of what drives our work to exist in the archive or in the field. Thank you. Thanks for the question. Um, from Kathy, what are some of the impact factors that you all have used to justify the value of your research in dossiers? It's a good question. <laughs> yeah. Uh, oh, man, it's like the worst part of your dossier, I think. Um, like, I hate to promote my work, you know, um, like, I just think it's terrible. I think everything I do is awful. So it's like, I just have a hard time, you know, doing it. But, um, and you know, being in a college of computing and computer science, apparently, like, all the conferences are graded. Like, you've got an A conference, an A-plus conference. It's like bond ratings or something. And so, you know, it, it's all done, you know. But then when you're talking to those people and you've presented at the conference, like, AIGA conference or something, they're like, oh, you know, well, what rating is that, you know, like they have some system for it and they don't understand that we don't, <laughs> you know, we don't have conference ratings. And so um, I feel like there's just a lot of editorializing about how prestigious an award is or isn't, you know, grant money always looks good as though you don't have to justify a project much if you got grant money to do it. I mean, I don't know. I think it's the hardest thing about putting your dossier together really is trying to quantify the impact because so much of my work in my dossier was creative work like we even talked about like the you know the impact our guitars had on you know the guitar industry I mean they were written they've been written up and they show up in 
publications and things like that and then there's other guitar makers that make guitars kind of like you know our guitars because we've been making them for a long time i mean there's like tech sort of organic technology transfer that happens you know with creative work like that that i think you can document you know um to make your case but it's i think it's harder than just saying oh i'm in this great discipline that just has conference ratings and all i need to do is present three papers a year at an a-rated conference and i'm good to go like that's not maybe that would be possible in design but that's not the path i picked you know and so it's really sloppy and everything has to be you know justified on it's you know differently shutting up again and what what's a dossier oh the, it's you know it's weird i think most people some people call it a dossier it's just like all the collection of everything you've done you know while you've been on your tenure track and there's like you know teaching material in there and letters from people you've worked with and it's like just this massive packet of stuff some people the scientists i work with they call theirs packet it's their tenure packet you know which i prefer but most people i work with call it a dossier um yeah which is yeah it's, it's just in french <laughs> <laughs> it's packed. Yeah, no, I guess I, I, I so I'm on tenure. It tracks mm -hmm. away. I've never done something like that. Never made a dossier. Um, I, mean, I think there's a similar, um, similar term is if you're in a non tenure track position and you have promotion, like mm -hmm. any kind of promotion uh, or reviews, you have the, yeah, the packet, the dossier, file, right, the file too. Oh uh, yeah, that, yeah. Oh man, what uh, what would I? say that what, if I had to do that now what would I do I don't know I I before I knew what you were talking about I understood the question I bit the I think slightly slightly different I would have interpreted it in terms of I guess I would always understand my terms in like a uh uh like an idealistic value or I mean because I deal with uh, design and um uh, crisis um or the climate crisis or try to help understand it not as a as a um, as a crisis that is could, can be solved with like a technological solution, but understand it um, as more of a cultural crisis. Um, and my work tries to contribute to understanding why. I mean, because we have the solution, we know the solution. So it's not a secret how to solve it, right? Well, the question is why are we not doing it? So I guess I would, but always try to justify my work with it helps figure out that, um, or at least tries to contribute to that so i just put in the chat we're trying to wrap up in the next couple of minutes so last call for any urgent questions um concerns or thoughts i thought people were going to come in the room with us but no, i guess they didn't no one joined it. us <laughs> i wanted to stay away <laughs> um I have a last question, I guess it might not be time for everyone to answer, but if any of you, something comes to mind, something that kept coming up in your presentations that I really appreciated was this idea of dis discipline, disciplinarities and anti-disciplinarities and crossing those boundaries and like not paying attention to them at all. I think all of you have crossed boundaries in some way. Um, and I'm wondering if there was a time that any of you needed to like defend that position of being anti or cross-disciplinary, multidisciplinary. And if so, how did you approach that? I mean, I felt like it was a constant defense, you know, for eight years. Um, I mean, I don't, I don't really know how I defended it, honestly. But, I mean, I just insisted on it. I mean, I just dug my heels in and was a petulant little child about it, you know, because I just wasn't, I think... I defended, I think, because the senior faculty probably were trying to help me, you know, and I was insisting that I was going to take the hardest way possible, you know, and so I just made bad decisions all the way through. That's all. I'll just speak quickly because it kind of connects to the justifying defending and justifying yourself and your work as a constant practice. So to me, those those are intersecting and it's so much to do with like developing the narrative and and just to speak to the other thing too. Like we we work in a in a place that has conventions 
to make us legible and to validate our work. And so to Kathy's question, like I, the fact, the impact factors I've used are convention in order to be legible, but who's to say you could do a residency, you know, like how do you sort of like, um, yeah, how, how do you work with that showing in galleries, publishing, like you know, all of those things. And then, um, yeah, I think so much has to do with like the narrative of the work that you're doing anecdotally and quantifiably, unfortunately. Um, so to separate myself from like that, knowing that that needs to be legible, but then also then like being in another mode of thinking that like, oh, well, this is also the impact that it has not in this criteria that I also have to be evaluated against. It was just a really helpful discerning moment for me. All right, thank you. And I think that wraps us up. Heather, do you have any last, last words of wisdom for us? <laughs> oh, you're unmuted. unmuted. I want to, my last words of wisdom are to unmute yourself. I just want to thank everyone. <laughs> we always have such a nice crowd. I'm sorry I didn't get to see the faces of the audience. Um, to welcome you to always send us feedback and thoughts and ideas for how to enhance this series. Uh, to Ayako for stepping in because one of our panelists had a family emergency. We are so grateful for you coming on board and sharing your wisdom, knowledge, and experience. And I think the three of you collectively uh, just had like such amazing things to share. So we're so thankful for your time. Thank you all so much for being here. Yeah. Thank okay. you all. We're staying. Don't leave yet. We'll okay. Stay for a sec. We're going to stay. We'll stay for a <laughs> sec. Yeah. Okay. Bye, everybody. <laughs> Are we done recording? Oh, wait, let's see. I'll I'll stop the recording. <laughs>